Okay, let's go ahead and open up to Romans 12. We've finished up a little refresher course on agape love because that's basically going to be everything. Uh, that's the ground for everything. Uh, when we get in chapter 12, uh, once you get down to verse 9, everything after that is going to be expansion of verse 9. Let love, agape love, be without dissimulation. Let it be genuine love. And he's going to go on. He's going to give all kinds of examples. That's based on. You get into chapter 13 and you see once you get out about verse 8 and 9 there, it's going to be all about love again. That's what regulates our relationship with others outside the assembly. And then uh, the weaker and brother example uh, during this transition period. Again, the regulating force is agape love. We went over on, on Sunday and we're looking at the, the Lord's Supper, what's traditional traditionally called that Lord's Supper, uh, and the Corinthian problems with the way they get together as a, as a community of believers uh, and the way they treat each other. And the, Paul's answer there we saw last week is agape love. Everything ref is going to flow out of that now. And so now as we, we've done a little refresher course on that, uh, and we've looked at this word beseeching, this word beseeching, the very first word, again, this is a couple verses here where almost every word uh, is something we could spend several weeks on. We won't do that, don't worry. Don't jump up and disconnect. Uh, I won't do that. We did talk about beseech, so we'll just go through that quickly. Uh, everything that we've covered in these first, 12, uh, first 11 chapters has been flowing into this. I stole this from another grace pastor. He called Roman, uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2 the knot in the bow tie. Uh, everything's been flowing into this. I've added, we've covered a good deal of Ephesians 1 to 3 as well. All that flows into this, and what comes out now is uh, it's what people call the practical or something. I would say the whole book is practical, but you get the idea uh, as far as how we interact with, uh, our, with fellow believers and how we interact uh, with uh, non-believers and how we treat each other, and that's all regulated by that agape love. And we saw beseeching, Paul is beseeching rather than commanding because uh, remember in Philemon, there's only one chapter, so there's no chapter to remember, but Philemon uh, 8, I think it was, Philemon 8, he said, I'm going to beseech you. He says, I could enjoin you, I could command you, I could force you to do something. Uh, receive an SMS, but I'm not going to. And he says, I'm going to beseech you, uh, the, use the grace word, and he says then, for love's sake. When it's beseeching, he's calling on a heart response uh, that can only come out of that agape love. It comes from looking at the Lord Jesus Christ and his work on that cross, and there we see the love of God at the cross of Christ. The, and when we believe that, we, the Holy Spirit takes it, puts it in our hearts, overflows our hearts with that love, and that's what motivates, it says in 2 Corinthians 5, constrains, motivates, uh, pushes us forward. Uh, to serve God by serving others, not out of selfish interest, but the way Christ did it, uh, and that's out of selfless interest, just to build up others in Christ. And so he's going to beseech, he's going to give them an opportunity to do something from the heart. It's going to be a benefit from the, for them. It's going to build them up. They're going to see, what are they going to see? Look over at the end of verse 2. What they're going to see is that they may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. He's going to give them an opportunity to do just that. So we have this beseech concept here. On the one hand, it's a grace word uh, because it all flows out of the uh, what God is free to do because of what his son did on the cross. Uh, so it's a grace word and it's something God has already given the believer everything he's giving. So that's what's so hard. Religion says the exact opposite. And unfa unfortunately, we're uh, very uh, attuned to religious systems and theological systems. And they say uh, that the key to the Christian life now is making yourself presentable to God to get another blessing or to get a reward or to maintain a blessing or to escape a punishment. And that's just religious nonsense. What we've learned in these first 11 chapters is that God has already given the believer everything up front. 
you have it all. He don't you don't have to wait for him to do anything else or give you anything else. He's given you and done it all in the personal work of his son on that cross. He's united you to himself through Christ. Uh, he's brought you into the family of God, Romans 5, uh, under the headship of Christ, where everything that belongs to Christ belongs to you uh, as far with regard to his work on that cross and as the head of the body of Christ. Everything belongs to you. He brought you in and he uh, placed you into Christ's death, burial, resurrection, uh, raised you from the dead, uh, and uh, we go, if we were to add on to that, what we know from Ephesians now, he uh, made you alive, he raised you up together with Christ and seated you together with Christ in the heavenlies. Ephesians 1.3, he says, I've already given you past tense all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. And the point is uh, that now you can't, uh, until you understand that, you can't, uh, operate according to what he says in Romans 12. It's only understanding that you already have everything. If you're a believer, he's given it to you all freely by grace. And it's because of that that it can be by love. If, he, if, you've, if he's given you access to his own account, just think if you had knew someone, uh, let's say he was a, a multi-trillion, trillion, trillionaire. Uh, is he going to worry so much right, when he wastes money spending it here and there? No, he's like, I got another trillion in the bank. Well, we as believers have access to the riches of God through Christ. And that's even way more than a trillion, 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 trillion. The point is that we can now just, uh, what, you know, what he wants us to do and what Paul and God are beseeching us here to do is now just throw out his riches to the world. Offer his blessings to the world. Uh, take bathtubs of his riches and throw them over the balcony down on the street and let them flutter wherever they go. It doesn't matter because it's an endless source. It's something of infinite value and it's something that's eternal. It's never going to run out. You throw a bathtub of the blessings over the rail down onto the street. You turn around, there's going to be two more bathtubs full. It never ends. You can just keep freely throwing blessings. You have access to the riches of God. Just freely throwing out those fruit of the Spirit, freely throwing out His grace, His peace, uh, and all the blessings that He has. Offering, bringing in, we're going to talk this about this a little bit later, His reconciliation to the world. Just throwing them all out. Forgiveness, long-suffering, joy, love, all that faith, all that. And the point is that when you realize it's beseeching, it's grace, because you've already received it all. He's given you everything he's going to give. You have access to the riches of the Father. And now freely give it away to others. And you can freely give it away to others because it comes from an infinite and eternal riches of Christ. You never have to worry about running out. Now, when we, uh, at a human standpoint, we have a nice little bank account. Now, what do we do? We have to make a monthly budget, and we don't. Want, we need to hoard a little money because there might be rough times coming. We need to have a little cushion. Uh, we can't spend everything. But you see, that's not the way to treat your Christian life, your believer life, your agape love and grace life, uh, because your riches aren't like your human riches. There, you have an infinite account to draw from. You can never use it all up. Just keep throwing them out. That's what Paul says. I beseech you now to just take a part, take part of this. Now that you know you have the riches, access to the riches of the Father through Christ, the Son. Just freely give it to others. And you can do this uh, because you have everything. You're eternally secure. The, your riches can't be lost and they can't be diminished. And here's the one that people don't like. You can't get any more. It's, he's just given it to you all in Christ. Every believer has full access to the riches of God. And he says, now just make use of that. And you don't have to hoard uh, like you do in earthly terms uh, because it's infinite and eternal 
value. Now you can just securely serve him selflessly, sharing our infinite and eternal riches in Christ with others because it comes out of an account that never ends, never is depleted. Uh, if you, th you throw out all the blessings you can, you're gonna turn around, you're gonna have 10 times more. You, can just, you have access to the infinite riches of Christ. And so he comes here and he says, I beseech the believers uh, to operate now and use those riches. Just in chapter eight, he told you uh, exactly how he's brought you into the family of God. Uh, and that brings another aspect of this beseeching concept. Uh, but, the, but Paul beseeches believers to do something, not to gain a reward, maintain a blessing, or escape a punishment, but because they have already received God's full package uh, for the body of Christ, full salvation package for the body of Christ in his mystery program. And that's what we're going to look at the next phrase here. I beseech you, this is 12, Romans 12, verse 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. Now that should kind of ring a little bit of a bell because we've talked about the mercies of someone else. Does anyone remember uh, what those are? Uh, we, we talked about them, uh, I think, last Sunday or the week, Sunday before and many times before that. Uh, there's a, a, a package, a salvation package for the nation of Israel that we've been reading about in Matthew and especially the Psalms and that Davidic covenant. Uh, and that's called the mercies of David. That's Israel's salvation package. National Israel's salvation package is called the mercies of David. In the mercies of David, that's that Davidic covenant, God himself promised David to enflesh himself into the line of David so that he could come and do, be a son of David that no, no other son of David could do. He could be a son of David that actually could provide salvation for the nation of Israel. Do what no other son of David could do, do what no other Israelite could do, and he can do it because he's not only the son of God, excuse me, the son of David, he's also the son of God. And he's going to come and he promised, remember in that Davidic covenant, uh, we call it, I call it the five mandates of that Davidic covenant. The first mandate, he's going to come and be Israel's redeemer. Then he's going to come and be Israel's deliverer and avenger. He's going to come and deliver them from his, their enemies. And then he's going to destroy their enemies. That's the avenging concept. Then he's going to usher them in that kingdom and be their king and their blesser five mandates of the Davidic covenant, covenant, what's called the mercies of David, and that's Israel's salvation program. Here he's talking about, that's not what he's talking about here. He's not talking about Israel's salvation package. Now it's the mercies of God, and that refers to the body of Christ's salvation package in this dispensation of grace and his mystery program, uh, again, for that body of Christ. Uh, that's what this is. He's going to now bring out these mercies. Uh, he's not referring back to the mercies of David, uh, although he did just a few verses before that. Does anyone remember where uh, he talked about the mercies of David? He didn't use that terminology, but he described that Davidic covenant and what Christ is going to do next when he restarts his program with the nation of Israel. Uh, just go up a few verses here to verse 26. Uh, here he's at the point where he's explained that God has temporarily postponed the fulfillment of his prophetic program with the nation of Israel. And now he's carrying out another work in the world called his mystery program with the body of Christ. But when that's complete, he's gonna return to his prophetic program with Israel. And that's where he picks it up here in verse 26. And at that time, uh, he's gonna begin working with that believing remnant again. And then that believing remnant will become believing Israel in verse 26, Romans 11, verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved uh, as it is written. Now he's gonna list out that Davidic covenant here in, this, in these two verses. Uh, he doesn't have to mention the first mandate, uh, Christ being their redeemer, because that's already happened. That happened at the cross, that happened before Paul. 
Now their program has been interrupted and Paul's explaining what's going to happen when he restarts his program with Israel. The next thing to happen is to fulfill the second and third mandates of that Davidic covenant. And let's read them here in verse 26. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer. There's Jesus. That's the second mandate of the Davidic covenant. The Lord Jesus is going to be their deliverer. Uh, and now you know what the, the next phrase, you could just figure out what Paul's saying here without even reading it. Because you know, well, what he probably ought to say something about the Avenger concept, uh, turning away wickedness from Israel. Now look at the next phrase in verse 26, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob, from Israel. There you have the deliverance. When he restarts his program with Israel, the Redeemer's aspect's already been fulfilled. He's going to restart. He's going to kick, be their deliverer. He's going to be their avenger. Then what's going to happen next? The kingdom and the blessings, right? Verse 27, for this is my covenant unto them when I shall take away their sins. That's the main blessing of that new covenant. Ushers them in the kingdom uh, where they receive the new covenant. He's going to be their king and their blesser. Those are the mercies of David. That's it, national Israel's complete salvation package. But that's not our complete salvation package. Our complete salvation package is here what he's calling the mercies of God. And that's going to go back, and we can just uh, follow this through. Notice it's mercies in the plural. Uh, it's the whole salvation package. And, of course, we're going to immediately think of just the verses before this. Look up at verse 31. In this mercy concept, it's what defines uh, what God's doing today. It's going to define everything about that. Uh, look what he's doing today, verse 31. Even so have these also now not believed, he's talking about uh, the Israel, uh, and through your mercy they have been, they, may, they also may obtain mercy. Uh, through uh, verse 32, for God hath concluded them all in belief that he might have mercy upon all. That's what God's doing today. That's the very key characteristic of what God's doing today. And it goes back to the fact uh, that he is now, uh, now he's in this dispensation of grace. It's on the one side, it's a great act of mercy. And on the other side of that coin, coin it's a great act of grace. It's the mercies of God because in this dispensation of grace, uh, God, you know the difference between mercy and grace, right? Mercy is holding back. Uh, let, me put it, let me put it the way I have it in my note here. Uh, not giving uh, the world, uh, us, what we deserve. That's wrath and judgment. Back at the stoning of Stephen, uh, the nation of Israel, and we joined hands with all the nations, Gentile nations of the earth, and thrust their fists up in the face of God and said, we rebel against you. We don't want you. We're your enemies. We're going to fight you. We don't want anything to do with you. And what Peter and Stephen thought he was going to do is re Christ is going to return in his wrath and judgment and destroy them, beginning with Saul, our apostle Paul, be uh, going on to the house of Israel and then especially the Gentiles and destroy them in his wrath and judgment. That's what they deserved. But what did he do instead? Instead, he decided to hold back his wrath and judgment, what they deserved. That's called mercy holding back what they deserve. Uh, and instead, what did he do? Instead of coming back and destroying his enemies, beginning with Saul, Paul, uh, and, especially, and it, going to the house of Israel, and especially the Gentiles, what did he do instead? He came back, hold that back holding that wrath and judgment back in mercy. He came back and raised up Paul, saved Paul, and raised him up. And beginning with the Jews, and especially the Gentiles, he's now offering the world his grace and peace. That's grace. His mercy indicates he's the, the program change. Uh, he's holding back his wrath and judgment that the world deserves. Uh, and instead, he's the flip side of that coin is that instead, out of his grace, he's extending his blessings to the world. 
on the basis of grace and faith, giving them. So mercy is holding back or not giving them what they deserve, his wrath and judgment. Grace is giving them what they don't deserve, his grace and peace. And that's what he's doing. That's these mercies of God, all this mercy that comes down uh, and has formed the basis of this time. Uh, and what the world needs to know more than anything is that that's what God, he's holding back that wrath and judgment. But it's only a little while longer. It's while he's being long suffering. And then we read in chapter 9, uh, that long suffering is going to come to an end someday. And he's going to do a quick work of wrath and judgment. So that's where those mercies of God come in. And the point of how it fits in with this beseeching concept uh, is that uh, we are to do things not to gain a reward, not to escape a punishment, not to gain a blessing or maintain a blessing, not to make ourselves think we can make ourselves more spiritual or more holy than ever. It's none of that kind of religious nonsense. It's simply enjoying the fact that you have already received all of God's blessings today all his mercies, all that he's dispensing now, all his blessings that he's dispensing during this time when he's being merciful and holding back his wrath and judgment during this dispensation of grace. And now uh, Paul is beseeching us on the basis of these mercies, the mercies of God. And that goes beyond just the dispensational change. That's the mercies, his justification, the sanctification. Uh, and uh, we know we're justified. We know how God justified us through the work of Christ on that cross. We know that now, you know, when you, that's Romans 1 to 4. Romans 5, we get all those blessings, reconciliation and peace with God. Chapter 6, we learn that uh, when we're just, he takes those he justifies and places them into Christ, into the making them members of the body of Christ, chapters 6 to 8. Then in chapters 9 to 11, he tells you our place in God's plan and purpose. We're not a part of God's prophetic program with the nation of Israel. We're part of his mystery program for the body of Christ. And we skipped ahead a little to Ephesians and saw uh, that we knew that Israel's prophetic program had to do with reestablishing his glory on the earth what he's doing today, what he kept secret uh, from all powers and principalities, all human and angelic peop uh, things, creation, uh, he's revealed to us, he's going to use a redeemed humanity, us, the body of Christ, to reestablish his glory in the heavenlies. What an amazing thing. And this beseeching on the basis of the mercies of God, not to gain a reward. I say this over and over again because it's so hard for people to understand. Uh, you, not to get something more from God, not to get God to do something for you, uh, not to go through some religious ritual or, or, or anything like that. It's just knowing that God has already made you complete in Christ. He's already given all the blessings. Romans 5 says, he goes through those blessings, and he says uh, trials and tribulations are no indication of the blessings. They don't mean God's withholding blessings, withholding his love. Uh, the only place you can look to know about God's blessings and God's love is not in your circumstances, but in the cross. And there you know, that's where you see his love. And it's something that's forever. Uh, it's eternal. It's infinite. And it flows out of that sonship position. By the time we get to Romans 12, and notice I have in parentheses the word should, uh, we should know uh, what the Father is doing today because he has brought us into his business and given access to the riches of Christ. Uh, and uh, hopefully, by the t now that we're are in chapter 12, uh, you, you can't get to chapter 12 without going through Romans 1 to 11. And if you haven't learned Romans 1 to 11 yet, well, then the answer is not to go on to Romans 12. The answer is to go back to Romans 1 and start over again. Uh, because that will tell you what God's done with you, what he's doing with you today, and what he, how you fit in his plan and purpose. 
And if you don't know that, you're not going to be able to go on to chapters 12 to 16. And any kind of what he calls here reasonable service, uh, in a uh, reasonable way of uh, walking in a way that's well pleasing to him. This is the way Pauline grace works, not the way the Mosaic law works. The Mosaic law said, uh, if you obey, I'll give you a blessing. If you disobey, I'll give you a curse. That's what the Israelites entered into foolishly and in their rebellion against the grace resident and God's Jehovah name. Uh, and they entered that, they said, treat us on that basis. And of course, they spent 1500 years under the curses of the law. Next time they're under the law, it's not gonna rely on their flesh. They're, the blessing of that new covenant is that the Spirit's gonna be in them. He's gonna put the law in their heart. He, the Spirit's gonna be with them and he's going to cause them to do the law. God's gonna do it himself. That's what they should have said back at, the, at Sinai. Uh, and the, the great Pauline grace doesn't work the way the Mosaic law work uh, through the flesh in the last, the 1500 years before Paul here. Uh, it's uh, relied on little children. They wanted to be treated like little children, discipline us uh, and uh, treat us like little children and tutors and governors. Uh, and God's not dealing with us to, like that today. That's the way the Mosaic law worked. Uh, today he's dealing with as we saw in Romans eight as adults and where he appealed to, uh, and adults aren't, are appealed to and encouraged to operate based on sound facts and ideas. You don't treat an adult uh, the way you treat a little child. You have a different way of dealing with them. And God doesn't want to deal with us on the basis of a law system uh, under tutors and governors. We learned in chapter eight what he wants to do and what he has done, whether you recognize it or not or appreciate it or not, doesn't really matter uh, what he's actually done. And when he you, uh, brought us into his family, he didn't bring us in the family as little children in our minority. He brought us in his family as adult sons and daughters, children in, the, in our majority. And he did that because he wants to include us in his plans and purposes and business. He wants to give us access to his riches. You don't do that with a little kid in the nursery. You send a tutor down there and they discipline and they tell them what to do, what to eat, where to go, when to go, what to watch, what not to watch. God doesn't want to deal with us that way. He wants us to deal with us on the base of adulthood and by learning what his plan and purpose uh, and all that he's done for us through Christ and how we fit in his program today and his program of the ages, uh, that when we realize that, he, and then he invites us, that's what he's doing here in Romans 12. He's inviting us now to participate in the family business, the father's business as adult sons and daughters. And we have, he's already said, if we went back to Romans 5, he's given us access to the riches of the Father. He's given us access to all that. And why don't we go back to Romans 5 and just look at these first verses here. Romans 5, and just look at this results of being justified by grace through faith. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We're at peace, we're reconciled. Actually, that's what, uh, especially these first 11 uh, verses or so here is this peace and reconciliation. Kind of keep that in mind because it's going to come, become important in our next phrase about a living sacrifice. But keep that in mind. Verse two, by whom we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand that we have access to the riches of the Father through Christ. And Romans 8, he brings us into the Father's business as adult sons and daughters. He wants us involved in his business intelligently, reasonably, uh, knowing what he's doing today, willingly, lovingly uh, participating in his thing, using his riches uh, to carry out his, to participate in carrying out his program. And by whom, verse 2, we have access by faith into the grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. 
He's made us participants in his glory, specifically reestablishing his glory in the heavenlies. And we have all these things. And now you come to chapter 12. Okay, go back to chapter 12. Uh, and he's driving these things home. We're more than conquerors. Uh, we're, uh, we just read in chapter 5, 1 to 3, that all the riches we have in just, being justified by faith, uh, not by works. These, you don't get these things by works. You get these things by grace through faith. They're all yours on that basis. Now he's appealing, he's beseeching with them, make use of these things. Let's look at a couple other high points. Go, to go back to chapter 5, verse 17, and let's just read at the, some of the high points we've hit here in our sonship position. Look what we're doing. We're not in a nursery. We doesn't, we would, now, most Christians are in a nursery. They, sell, they put themselves in a nursery, uh, but he doesn't want us in a nursery. He wants us out there. He's fully equipped us, given us access to his riches, told us what he's doing in the world today. And look at verse 17 of chapter 5. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which, uh, which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, that's us, shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. We reign in life. Look down at verse 21. That sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Where he wants us to reign in righteousness, reign in life, reign under the rule of grace. Go to the end of chapter 8. If we look at each of these major sections, look how they end. Go to the uh, Romans 8, verse 35. <clears throat> Listen to this great uh, call of victory here. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And the, the point is no one, nothing and no one anywhere. And he's going to list it out now. Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Uh, we have full access to the riches of the Father. We reign in righteousness, life, and grace through Christ. Uh, and now we're more than conquerors. For I am persuaded. <clears throat> oh, we don't want to forget those final two words. Through him, this is verse 37, through him that loved us, loved us at Calvary, at the cross. That's our agape love. Uh, and that's the, that's the driving motive in all this. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, uh, nor th uh, things present, nor things to come. When we read in, for, in Ephesians uh, 2, uh, he talked about what he did with the believer. What did he do with him? He raised him, he, he, uh, raised him with, together with Christ, who quickened him together with Christ, made him alive with Christ, raised him together with Christ, and seated him in the heavenlies together with Christ. And where is Christ in the heavenlies? Above all powers and principalities. And we're seated together with him. Nothing, nor height, verse 39, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from, here we go again, the love. Our agape love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us. We have an infinite source of blessings. Uh, we're in full, uh, he's revealed fully to us what he's doing today. And now Paul is beseeching us, get in line with it. Why? Why can't we do that? Go to chapter 11 now. And just remember this doxology at the end of chapter 11, verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of his wisdom and knowledge of, and, and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments. Uh, but the, the important thing to remember is we were over in Ephesians 3, and he said now those unsearchable truths are searchable in Paul's writings. Uh, and his ways past finding out. We read in Ephesians 3 that those ways that were past finding now, he's now revealed and his desire is that all people know about them. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, we have the mind of Christ. Ephesians, or, um, 1 Corinthians 2. 
We can know these things now. He, he, when he talks about the mystery in those uh, later epistles, he brings us into the full knowledge of the mystery. Now we have the mind of Christ, or who hath been his counselor? Uh, and, or who hath first given to him that it shall be re recompensed unto him? He's not doing any of this because he, uh, someone, he's in someone's debt. He owes something to someone. He's doing this because he's the creator of the universe. And he's come up with this new program. He always revealed since the beginning of the world, since the creation of the world, uh, how he's going to reestablish his glory on earth. But what he never revealed before was how he's going to reestablish his glory in the heavenlies from the satanic fall and the angelic fall. And that's the wisdom. And now he's revealed it to us. Now you know your plan. Of that's what God's doing today. And he says, for of him, everything is of him, and through him he sustains all things, and to him, the ultimate goal of everything uh, is Christ uh, and the God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ, the triune God, are all things to whom be glory forever and ever. And we are a participant of that glory. It's an amazing thing when you get through these first 11 chapters of Romans. Uh, it is, we know what he's doing. We, and now he's beseeching us on the basis of what he's doing now while he mercifully holds back his wrath and judgment, calling out another people unto himself uh, to participate in his glory in the heavenlies. He beseeches. Now he has them do something. Now he's going to tell them, finally do something everybody wants to know i want something to do and you know he really hasn't let us do anything in these last the three uh, last 11 chapters he's done everything for us now we have something to do i beseech you back to romans 12 verse 1 i beseech you therefore and we come to the next major phrase uh, by the mercies of God. Don't do it. I'm going to say it again. To gain a reward, uh, attain a blessing, maintain a blessing, escape a punishment, whatever little things you're thinking of in your head that you're trying to get God to do or just throw all that away. He's already blessed you with all the blessings he's giving. And they can't be diminished. They can't be taken away. They can't even be increased. They're just all there through Christ. And now he says, on the basis of that, so just feel free to throw those blessings out to the world. They're never going to end. No matter how many, how many blessings you throw out to the world, you'll have more when you turn around. They don't end. They're infinite, eternal. You can do it with absolute security. Everything's taken care of. He's got everything under control. He knows what he's doing with you. He's brought you in his plans and purposes. And now he says, uh, that's your, the attitude to take based on the mercies of God, not getting something out of selfish interest, uh, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, uh, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And that's really one, the main one we want to look at tonight, is this presenting the bodies uh, a living sacrifice. Usually, when I've seen this taught, uh, usually people kind of read into this Romans 6. Uh, they say that um, he's really just kind of repeating what he said there about the believer dying and rising uh, together with Christ unto newness of life and that he should therefore uh, reckon himself alive from the dead. Let's just go look at that. Go over to chapter 6. Chapter 6. And let's just see uh, how you can, you can kind of read chapter 6 into chapter 11. We'll pick it up. We're not going to read every verse here, but let's pick it up at verse 3. Know ye not that so many of us as are, are baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. When you were baptized, no water in this passage. This is a spiritual baptism. Uh, it happens, it occurs without human hands and without a medium of water. Uh, it's done by the, the God uh, and he places the believer into Christ. Uh, he identifies the believer with Christ. And when you're identified with Christ, God says, you're identified with with other aspects of who Christ is. And here it says you're identified, baptized, placed into, identified into his death. 
Uh, therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So here we have the believer. He's placed into the death of, he's identified with Christ, which means he's identified with his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And he's alive now before God. Uh, look over at verse uh, verse 6, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, uh, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, uh, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death has no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, verse 11, and this is where it sounds a little bit like Romans 12, uh, 1. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Uh, and sometimes people will say that's what he's talking about in Romans 12. But there's a little bit of a problem with that. And the main problem is, what is it, when I read this passage, what was the key word uh, that kept being said over and over and over again? He's talking about the believer being put to death. The believer's identified with the death of Christ. He's placed into his death. He's crucified. The old man is crucified. Uh, now, if we be dead with Christ, verse 8. But go to, back to chapter 12. Chapter 12, uh, he doesn't say that. He says that uh, he says, present your bodies living sacrifices. In chapter six, he's describing what it means to be a living believer now. A believer as a whole, believers by very definitions are one who've been placed into the death, burial, resurrection of Christ, uh, and now are, are alive to God through Christ. They died with Christ. What this, what chapter 6 is about, is about living believers, believers living, us living before God. But that's really not what chapter 12 says. What's the thing that's living in chapter 12, verse 1? Is it the believer? Look at verse, verse 1 again. Uh, and we, if we need to be careful readers, I think, because if we don't, we're going to miss something. I think this passage is saying. He's saying that ye, that's the believers, you believers... Uh, present your bodies a living sacrifice. What's living here? Uh, it's not the believer. That's not what he's emphasizing. It's true that believers are living, but that's not what Paul's talking about here. He's talking about the sacrifice is living. Romans 6 is about the believers de dying and living uh, before God, dying and raising, rising with Christ and living before God. But that's not what he's talking about in chapter 12. One. In chapter 12, one, it's the sacrifice that's living, not the believer. Now, the believer is living. That doesn't deny that, but that's not what Paul's talking about, I don't think, anyway, in chapter 12. He's not re referring to believers living. And then sometimes people will go to chapter 8 and say, this is what he's talking about in Romans 12, 1. Go to uh, Romans 8. And pick it up at verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies. Make alive your mortal bodies uh, by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, ye, uh, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. That will end your walk in the spirit. And if ye through the Spirit do mortify, put to death the deeds of the body, you shall live. But once again, in Romans 12, like in Romans 6, now in Romans 8, uh, in Romans 12, there's nothing about putting anything to death. In Romans 6, it talked about how the believer was living before God. In chapter 8, it tells how the Spirit makes the body live. But neither of those things are what chapter 12, verse 1 is talking about. He's not talking about living believers or living bodies. Go back to chapter 12 now. He's talking about a living sacrifice. 
He says, ye, you believers, uh, use your bodies now, present your bodies, living sacrifice. Now we know from chapter 6 that the believer is living, and we know from chapter 8 that the body is living, but that's not what Paul's bringing out. That's not what he's emphasizing in chapter, uh, verse 1 here at chapter 12. Here he's emphasizing that the sacrifice is living. And so I think we need to take uh, a little bit of a look at that and uh, see what he might be talking about here uh, and take a look at that. Now in Romans, in Romans 12, 1, uh, God's telling, uh, now in Romans 12, 1, God's telling living believers, that's what we learn about in Romans 6, with living bodies, those who are walking according to the Spirit in Romans 8, now he's telling them, he's not really talking about the living believer or the living body at this point. He's already dealt with that. Now he's talking about uh, uh, presenting those things as a living sacrifice. And that's a, kind of an oxymoron, isn't it? Because sacrifices are normally thought of as dead. Now, in chapter 6 and chapter 8, there was a lot of talk about uh, us dying, dying with Christ, the body being put to death, the lust of the flesh being put to death, mortifying the deeds of the body, all kinds of stuff being put to death. It doesn't say anything like that about the sacrifice here. This is a sacrifice that isn't put to death. Uh, one commentator I read said, uh, that this is a kind of sacrifice completely unknown in the Old Testament. Uh, there, even though all there, even though all the sacrifices arrived alive, you know, they're all brought into the temple alive, spotless, blameless, or blemishless. Uh, what are they, less than one year old or something, and male, and all these specifications, they come in alive, uh, but none of them leave the temple alive, right? They get sacrificed. That's the whole point of a sacrifice. That's what we normally think of. Uh, and that, that one commentator said that, uh, so that you have to spiritualize this verse. Uh, and that's why people usually resort by going back to Romans 6 or Romans 8 uh, as really saying the same thing this verse is saying. But I'm going to suggest that it's not saying the same thing as Romans 6 and Romans 8. It's taking everything another step further. And that's what we're going to look at now. Uh, usually when this is taught, it's just kind of reduced uh, to what, what I call identity theology. You know, what he's basically saying here is just live uh, based on who you are that you learned about in Romans 6 uh, and, and Romans 8. Uh, and as important as that is, uh, I think there's something else going on here. So that's what we're going to look at in these last few minutes. And because uh, when I read this from this commentator, I was thinking that uh, it's not quite true. I could think of another sacrifice in Israel's program, in Israel's sacrificial system, that was not put to death. It was a sacrifice that wasn't put to death. Uh, there's only one, and that's what we're going to look at now. Uh, it's not quite true what he said. There was one sacrifice that was not put to death. And that was all the Old Testament sacrifices were holy and acceptable to God, but all of them uh, were put to death except one. And you, anyone remember what that is when I kind of set the groundwork? Uh, that one is one of the two sacrificial goats on the Day of Atonement. It's called the scapegoat, the escape goat. He was sent out into the wilderness. It's the only sacrifice in Israel's system, a sacrificial system that wasn't put to death. It was a living sacrifice. And so that's what I want to just take a look at uh, for a few minutes here uh, and bring out some things. Let's go back to Leviticus 16. Leviticus 16. And we'll see this Day of Atonement. We're not going to completely develop this whole thing. We're just going to read through and about this sacrifice. Uh, the one and only sacrifice that at least I know of in Israel's sacrificial system that wasn't put to death. It was a living sacrifice. Uh, let's just pick it up here in verse 2. 
uh, chapter, this is Leviticus 16, uh, verse 2, and he's talking about this day of atonement, this one time a year, uh, Aaron is can go into the Holy of Holies, he sprinkles blood, uh, goes through this whole ritual, and let's just read about it. Verse 2, and he's doing this for the nation of Israel uh, to, re to resume, uh, to reconcile the nation of Israel uh, to God so he can remain and, and stay there and dwell among them. Verse 2, And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at, at all times into the holy place within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, but let that he die. He couldn't go in there just any time. It was just this one time a year. Uh, and he says, For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. Thus shall Aaron come into the holy place with a young bullock and a, uh, for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. So here we have a sin offering, the young bullock, and the ram for the burnt offering. And of course, offering is the same thing as saying a, a sacrifice. Verse 4, he shall put on the holy linen coat. He goes through this whole ritual thing. He's got to take off all his street clothes, all his other priestly garments. He's got to put just pure white linen, pure, uh, so he can go into this one time a year into the holy place, this holy place where the ark is. And, uh, and he says, he shall put on holy linen, verse, a holy linen coat, verse 4, and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh and shall be girded with a linen girdle and a linen miter shall be attired, shall he be attired. These are holy gar garments, therefore he shall wash his flesh in water and soap and so forth. Uh, and he goes through this whole ritual. Now he's going to do some other things. Verse 5, and he shall take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats for a sin offering. That's as, as a sin offering, as a sin, a sacrifice. Uh, and one, two, so he's going to take two goats for the sin offering uh, and one ram for the burnt offering. And now we're going to see uh, some differences here. Look at verse 6. And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, uh, and make an atonement for himself. Notice how many times in these few verses it's for, the, the, these sacrifices they're talking about here are for Aaron, for himself. He says, verse 6, and Aaron shall offer his bullock uh, as a sin offering, which is for himself and make it an atonement for himself and for his house. Of course, before himself also included his house, his household. Uh, and of course, the, the fellow priests there. Verse seven, and he shall take the two goats, and now we'll go to the two goats, and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron shall cast lots upon the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. Uh, and that just refers to, a, a, I don't know, uh, you know why they, king, or I don't know why the King James left the E off here, but it basically just means the escape goat. Uh, it's the goat that they're going to release into the wild. He's going to escape being put to death. And he says, verse 9, And Aaron shall bring the goat upon which the Lord, Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. So one, they're going to put to death. But the goat on which the lot fell be the scapegoat, the escape goat, uh, shall be presented alive before the Lord. He make, uh, to make an atonement with him and to let him go for an escape goat into the wilderness. So here you have, they're both called sin offering. And one of them becomes a dead sin offering and one of them becomes a living sin offering. And he's going to do this. Uh, and we're going to see what he does this for. Uh, but now they, here we have the one sacrifice that's living in Israel's sacrificial system. The only one. Here's one that was designated a sacrifice, but it escapes that. 
and it's going to go into the wilderness. Now pick it up at verse 11 and just notice the uh, go or back to Aaron now. And he says, verse 11, And Aaron shall bring the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and shall make atonement for himself. You notice, for himself, for himself, for his house. Uh, and shall kill the bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself. And he's going to go through here and all this stuff he's going to do for himself. The other sacrifices on this day were for himself. But now look at this scapegoat, uh, what he's for. Go down to verse, uh, go down to verse, uh, oh, let's pick it up at verse 20. Verse 20, we'll pick it up there. And when he hath made an end of reconciling, you know, the atonement is, uh, is a term uh, similar to our reconciliation. Of course, atonement and reconciliation in the Old Testament was more the idea of a, a, a covering uh, because it was the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, is going to be the ultimate atonement and reconciliation. But they go through these here to have this covering. Verse 20, And when he had made an end of reconciling the holy place and the tabernacle of the congregation of the altar, he shall bring the live goat in now. Here's the living sacrifice. And Aaron shall lay both hands on his, on the, upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all the transgressions and their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. And now what you get here is you get this, this escape goat. Uh, it's for others. Every, all the other sacrifice in this uh, day of atonement is for Aaron and his household, for himself. This scapegoat is for the nation of Israel, for the children of Israel. It's for others that he's doing this. And what I, what I guess I'm trying to bring out here is that in Romans 12:1, uh, Paul is beseeching those who have died and rose again with Christ uh, and are now alive before him. That's Romans 6. That's believer, living believers. And who are now walking according to the Spirit, who gives life to their uh, mortal bodies, their dying bodies. That's Romans 8. So you have living believers with living bodies now. And now he's beseeching them. And he's saying, now offer that body as a living sacrifice on behalf of others like that a scapegoat, that one living sacrifice in all of Israel's sacrificial system uh, that Aaron does on that day of atonement, uh, you know, and atonement and reconciliation go together. Uh, and he's telling them now, t take what you learned in Romans 6 as living uh, believers before God. Uh, and in Romans 8, as, as now they walk according to the Spirit, so your bodies are living. And now offer, present them as a living sacrifice on the, for, on the behalf of others. And it all comes down to this atonement concept. You know, we've come up with this atonement. We've talked about atonement and reconciliation before in Romans. Go to Romans 5. Romans 5. Romans 5 opens with the peace concept. That's a uh, type of reconciliation. That's an aspect of reconciliation. The Day of Atonement was a day of reconciliation. We re read that back in uh, Leviticus 16. I think it was verse 20. Uh, and through Israel, the whole world. Today in the dispensation of grace, we, uh, we have been reconciled unto God, having that atonement <clears throat> united to God. You know, atonement at one mint being brought together with Christ, with God through Christ, we receive that atonement. Let's read about it here in chapter 5. Romans 5, verse 10. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. 
And uh, that's uh, the actual same word for reconciliation in the, in the other verses there. But we have been brought, we've been made at one with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. There's this whole atonement and this living sacrifice was the scapegoat uh, on that day of atonement that Israel participated in when the, they were reconciled so God could dwell among them. Uh, and now he refers to living believers with living bodies, Romans 8, now being living sacrifices on behalf of others. That's what that scapegoat, it was something on behalf of others. It was something done for others. Uh, go now to, and we'll close with this, 2 Corinthians. You see, what, what is our actual, actual uh, some people call this the Great Commission, of the body of Christ. What is our great commission? What is our, min our primary ministry? 2 Corinthians 5, look at verse 18. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Here we have reconciled again. Reconciled to God through Christ, and have given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That's that at what meant, that atonement idea. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to him. Uh, we read that, verse 19, to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, uh, not imputing their trespasses under them and have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ as though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. And I, I suggest that in Romans 12, 1, he's taking now that living, that concept of the living sacrifice. There's only one living sacrifice in all Israel's sacrificial system, the day of atonement, the day of reconciliation. Uh, and he's tying it in, not that that's a part of our program or anything. Christ has fulfilled all that. Uh, Christ has been what the, the, dead, the dead goat on that day and the, and the scapegoat. He's fulfilled that in himself. He's taken all the guilt and sin onto himself. That has nothing to do with us. But it's on behalf of others. We can now participate in this ministry of reconciliation, this ministry of at one man to the world he's offering. And I suggest Paul in Romans 12, 1, is takes the truths from Romans 6 uh, that we're now living believers and adds to that Romans 12 with uh, when we walk according to the Spirit, we have living bodies and to use those things, present them, uh, d uh, offer them up as a living sacrifice for the benefit of others. And of course, that brings us, we'll end on this, the final two words on my slide. We're all the way back again to agape love. Let's close with a word of prayer.